Thanks, Christy. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, my, my name is John Reed. I'm from Parsons Sprinkler Hoff in Atlanta. Uh, I haven't always been a southerner in Atlanta. I originally have uh, some Michigan and Canadian blood in me, so I'm like the only person you'll hear say y'all and Eddie in the same sentence. Um, but uh, I, uh, um, been researching and doing a lot of, a lot of research through uh, Company Fellowship, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, on these unconventional or, or, or non-traditional type intersection approaches. And I put together this presentation and given it many different places across the country. I actually was in uh, in Austin uh, about a year ago and gave it to, at the time, it was called Austin District. I don't know if we organized or whatnot, but it was the, the, that group and the headquarters <coughs> folks. Um, and uh, it was received pretty well, I think, and got, got some ideas flowing. So. Uh, the other thing about me is, again, my, my Midwestern background, I tend to talk fast, and it's not because I'm nervous, it's, uh, it's more just that's the way I talk, and I get excited. I know, excited traffic engineers are great. But, uh, uh, if, so if you, you know, can't understand me, slow down. I, I have to give this presentation to a, a, a folks in rural Georgia, and got to my presentation, and first question asked, and laid in the back, raised her hand, and said, um, you know, you're not from around here, are you? I said, no, I'm from Michigan, I'm going through the story, and she said, well, you talk fast. I said, yeah, I, I think I do, and she said, we don't listen that fast. <laughs> so, you know, if, if that gets a problem, let me know. But uh, anyways, I'll try to get through as much. The thing is I have a lot of material to go through, so I will try and get through it all with you. Um, what we're going to talk about today is to focus on, and thank you for that great introduction, because this is precisely what the, the program gets at, is these areas where we have busy, congested arterials, so main streets that carry a lot of traffic, and the problem of them and not wanting to build overpasses and trying to handle and manage congested intersections. So I want to put us in the mindset of what we're talking about is arterials, or principal roadways. And these roadways, they, com they, they comprise only about 10% of all roadways built, but they, they carry almost half the daily, tra daily traffic volumes. And only short of a freeway does that ratio any worse. So, uh, so they're very important to, you know, to the to communities, they're very, very important to delivery of goods. Um, and I, I went to, uh, I'm not real familiar with the Houston area, so I went to Google Maps and thought that maybe uh, State Route 6 or State Highway 6 and Trumbull Parkway and Telephone Road, those are the kind of roadways we're talking about, wide, uh, multi-lane uh, roadways with signalized intersections that, that could be problematic in congested periods. Um, so if you look at ASHCO, our, our Bible as traffic engineers, uh, about what arterials should do and what their function should be, they're, they're mainly to provide uh, mobility with, with provisional or, or partial access to uh, land uses. So if you think about it like as a scale from local streets, which you want just local folks on, to freeways, which really restrict access, arterials tend to be on that side where we're trying to promote through trips, we're trying to promote uh, heavy use, we're trying to promote transit trips uh, to and from activity centers, shopping centers, uh, CDBs, even our bypasses. So, so we want to promote that, 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 that quality of trip and typically we try and design in place mechanisms to keep that, uh, that capacity in place. Now, of course, as long as time goes on, you add more and more signals and it kind of degrades your experience. But ideally, they're supposed to be designed to try and maximize that, that travel flow and travel speeds. So before we talk about unconventional intersections, let's just, let's just talk about what conventional design is. And basically, we're, we're talking about roadways that are multi-lane roadways that meet at a signalized intersection, typically both multi-lane, and typically they have some kind of signalization and often, very often, it's, it's multi-phased and, and protected with LFs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you have usually wide geometries and for, you know, for trucks and for radiuses and double turn lanes, all that kind of stuff. So, and, and these are what we're most familiar with in America and in 98% of the cases, they're probably the best solution. Uh, they're what people are you know, familiar with and they're, you know, people are comfortable and probably safety-wise. And so, you know, let them be. But there are, there are some that, that don't meet this criteria that we want to try and improve in a different way, and um, we'll go through a, ways you can do that. Um, one of the, con the constraints of, uh, of this intersection, obviously the signal. Now, this is not a traffic signal. This happens to be a statue in Germany, but it kind of gives the idea that you know we come to along a major street, you come to the signal on the intersection, and you wait, and you do all kinds of things while you're waiting, and you know whatever it is for two, three minutes, and then you get you know get going for a little while, maybe you get up to speed, and then you come to the next signal and you wait. So you kind of have this profile along, especially if you're going a long distance where it's, you know, hurry up and go along the arterial. And, and, and the signal by its intersection is that limiting capacity. So if we were able to somehow unlock some of that capacity, you, you get, I think, greater use along the whole of the arterial and get people confident that they can use the arterial rather than just, you know, jumping on the freeway. I don't, I don't know if it's like around here, but Atlanta, we don't have many straight roads uh, that go very far on our freeways. So what people tend to do is they say, well, 
uh, point A and point B, the, the closest distance is the freeway, or, or it might be an arterial, but they take the freeway because that's, they think they can go faster. So if we're able to improve the arterial system, it might have other benefits to the freeway systems and, and take people off of collectors and local streets that are trying to cut through as well. So that's, that's what we're aimed at trying to do. And it seems like you're in the same boat as Atlanta and everywhere else in the country. Uh, we need a good intersection uh, capacities for a number of things that, that are, are communities rely on it for growth and for services. Uh, but we're facing a lot of challenges. That, that, you know, obviously, the money shortage. It's expensive to build structures and, and maintain roadways, and we're already trying to maintain what we've got. Uh, you know, freeways are take years to build and develop. Um, and even, even widening of roads can be have, have a lot of roadside impact and can be uh, environmentally unfriendly. That kind of thing. So. Uh, I, ITS is, any of you guys ITS engineers? Don't offend anyone that uh, says ITS is a good, a good part, but not the whole solution. I mean, we can, we can squeeze out at the lemon a little bit more capacity with good ITS programs and so you, you know, automated signals and, and, and progression and all that kind of stuff, but it's not the total solution. And again, we're trying to find that, that you know, low cost, high reward type improvements that intersection improvements can often bring. Okay, so this brings me to uh, the, the the fellowship program, uh, part of my company uh, sponsors an annual fellowship program. And at the time I was in college <coughs> studying unconventional designs at Hume and Hacks, I like to write a book about uh, unconventional intersections and see what, what's used other places and what, what other what regions do, uh, not only in the United States but worldwide. So I, I was able to get some funding and wrote a book and visited uh, all across the country, went to folks and visited states and said, What are your issues? What are your concerns? What design do you use? And, how innovative can you be? And so all that kind of came together in the book, and a lot of that's in this presentation. I have a few copies I'll leave behind. I, I only have a couple because actually this, this, I think I only have about four left on my shelf. I'm, I'm in the middle of a rewrite. I'm already giving away like 1,500 of these things to people um, because they're, they're popular, but um, so I'm trying to get an update going. But uh, in, in that, there's some information on uh, the survey that I, I, I put out to the states, and I got a pretty good response. About 33 different states responded. And I ask and, you know, questions, and some of them I met on, on site, see sites, and uh, again, updates coming out soon. So uh, if you don't get one now, I can make arrangements later to get you one. But very interesting, some of the results from the survey, which I've seen from that time forward uh, repeatedly, uh, that uh, the, most states are very eager for innovation. They, they face the same problems you mentioned about the cost being high, about being having designs that are uh, cost effective, and also safe. Safety was, is always a major concern. A lot of our, our programs get built from, for safety concerns, uh, these big intersections. So, and then they also wanted designs that are contextual in nature, that, that sort of fit the environment or fit the community and can just blow through and divide a community. So, uh, and then again, we, I asked about you know, uh, proactiveness to thinking about new things, innovative things. And, a lot of states said, sure, we'll, we'll study anything, and some of them have already been doing some of the same research I had about these new designs. And a couple of states said, well, you know, when the 49 states does it, we'll do it. You know, but so it's kind of a mixed, mixed result on proactiveness. Um, and then also notice that, that a lot of states or regions have their, their designs. Like if you go up to the, to the Northeast, you see a lot of more roundabouts and that kind of thing. If you go to Michigan, my home state, you see uh, this thing called the Michigan U-turn. Uh, down here, you, you guys have the Texas, uh, the, the what we call it, the, the uh, Texas for interchange thing. Yeah, for intro systems. And you see a lot in Texas and not, not too much other places. So so a lot of that goes, you know, behind you when you do something new, you have know, to step back and evaluate, you know, not only the newness, but how does it fit what we're doing, where we're going. So there's a lot of that dialogue going on. And, and since I wrote the fellowship in uh, 2002 or so, the present, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of like, more material out there, a lot of discussion, and you'll probably see some of these designs and recognize them as they're coming, because all the states are grappling with a lot of the same issues. All right, so let's, oh, uh, and, and this, re more recently, there's a few really good uh, uh, books published. Federal Highway put out this alternative intersections informational report that lists a lot of the, talks about the designs. Of course, the, the signal provides an information guide, but also Federal Highway puts out uh, in, in back chapters, there are a few, few talks about unconventional designs. And then if you ever see the US DOT tech briefs that come out on you know, a new design or a lot of information, about those. So there's no more wealth out there as you search the internet and other places for these, these kind of programs. So let's talk about unconventional intersections. What, what, what does that mean? Well, I think there's, there's three basic principles when you look at unconventional intersections. Um, and I call them three R's. The first one is to, to reroute left-hand turns. Uh, left-hand turns um, are a play to uh, motorists. And if we ever remove them, I think I'd be out of a job. Because that seems to be the movement that requires most attention, the most difficulty, and the most time away from 
other movements. Um, by the way, did, did anyone happen to see uh, Diane Sawyer's, per, uh, I think it was uh, Tuesday night, Diane Sawyer had a little snippet on, on Super Street, what he that meant, and she actually uh, interviewed my, my professor at North Carolina State, uh, him, and he was talking about left-hand turns and the problem it is, whatever, so it, we're, we're making prime time now. So, so, um, but, uh, so, so removing those left turns, somehow getting rid of them, Talk about it. not magic, but, but getting out, out of the main intersection so you have more uh, you know, north, south, east, west movements could, could unlock some of that capacity we're talking about and provide you with better uh, signal service and, and, and less delays and all that kind of stuff. Well, how is that done? I'm going to make you hungry now. Uh, it's, it's all about the slice of the pie. And if you, if you pick your, picture it, say, cycle length, uh, if, if you wait for a, for a traffic signal as a piece of pie, you know, each, each movement gets its own slice of the pie. If you're sitting on the, uh, the, the wait for a light, someone else is moving, it's their turn, and you've got to wait your turn. And there's only so many pieces of the pie to slice up. There's no magic to it. We can't make a bigger pie. It's just that's the way it is. Um, but how that translates into, I think there you go. Um, how that translates into uh, intersections is we're talking about reducing the, the, reducing the signal phases. Again, a, a normal signal, you, you have at least four phases. You, know, you have the, the, the the main street can go, and then maybe the left turns can go, and then the cross street go, and their left hand turns go. If we're talking about a protected um, signal, so if we're able to remove those left hand turns. We go from from a, a four four phase signal to a two phase signal. You know, go through, walk through these. That's my pointer here. Uh, up top here represents again the slice of the pie that each each movement is going to get. Let's say this is your 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 arterial street gets so much slice of the pie. And then in between, you obviously have to have a clearance phase. It's non-negotiable. You've got to have yellow and all red for safety. So that's that slice of the pie. And then you go to the other through movement and then clear that out. And then you go to the cross street left and cross, so forth. So you go around the signal cycle. Well, one of the great tricks for traffic engineers to do when we run a capacity is actually do a little bit of pie. Instead of saying this was a 90 second cycle, let's do let's go up to a 150 second cycle. So instead of a minute and a half, now we're approaching two minutes or, or, or more than two minutes. So, so what that does is it gives you a little more pie because these clearance phases are fixed times. So since your cycle length is longer, you have a little less time in the pie. So you get a little more, uh, a little more um, capacity through there. But the problem is when you have a longer cycle length, what happens to your queues and delays? They get longer because you you're, you're capturing more people. And you can go, you know, high, I've seen high as 300 second cycles, but it just it, it, it ends up a lot of queuing in your, and then you're stuck because you can't go back. So what this does is this example here is now we're going from this four-phase operation to a two-phase operation, where we simply allow the through moves in the cross street, you know, one 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 phase clear, and then the through moves from the arterial through and right. So you see, obviously, we get a lot better, a lot bigger slice of the pie. And a better way to illustrate it is, is this: if you if you picture this as your, uh, your, your linear pie now, uh, that you have your turn movements, and then you have through movements, and the other turns through movements. Okay, so we go from those phases to a two-phase signal. And so obviously we've eliminated two different yellow times. And then not only that is you can make a shorter cycle length and still have more time given to the through movement. So you can increase that out. So that's kind of the, the genius behind a lot of these that we're trying to get to that, that two-phase signal. So I've explained it already. Um, the other benefit to unconventional intersections is on the safety side, when we remove, uh, we remove or separate additional conflicts. At a, at a normal intersection, you've got 32 different points of conflict. Uh, that means 30 different places that people can run into each other, and they do. Uh, some of the most severe are the, the head-ons, you know, uh, or, or the, uh, the, the T-bones. And see, when, when, you get, when you get to a no left turn scenario, you go from 32 conflict points down to 12. So, and you've eliminated some of your most severe types. Yes, there's some could be accidents, and yes, there's some unfamiliarity that can creep into some of these designs, but by and large, most of them have seen substantial, uh, uh, substantial benefits to safety because we've eliminated signal phases and made it a lot easier on, on, on drivers or fewer conflict points throughout. So that's kind of the, the principles behind it. Um, when, we, when you talk about unconventional uh, designs, you know, some, some, uh, some engineers get the whiskers in the back of the up because they think, well, they're going to be unsafe. You know, we're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of accidents. Well, that, that's not true. And we'll, I'll show you a little later about some of the safety specifics that come out of these. They think, well, they're, they're, they're uh, unaffordable. We're adding, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more money to do to widen and this or that. And again, that's not true, especially when you consider the comparison to, uh, to building an overpass. They say maybe it's undesirable to the community. You know, I'm telling my citizens that they got to turn right to go left. What's this? You know, and, and, and that's not always true either. Uh, they, they think 
maybe, maybe they're unfriendly pedestrians, but pedestrians don't know how to do it. But that's also not true. The pedestrians benefit by, by a two-phase two uh, signal as well because they have longer times to cross and fewer conflicts as well. And, and they don't have to be difficult to understand either, although we are requiring drivers to do something a little different than they're used to. So that's kind of the basis of unconventional designs. Let's look at uh, some specifics, and I broke them up into uh, some specific uh, arterial type where you're looking at the whole corridor, and then we'll talk about some that are more intersection by intersection specific, and then finally I'll talk about some overpass type designs as well. So let's start, I'll start, I'll be biased and start in Michigan because this is the way I grew up thinking that people drove. Uh, this is called media U-turn, some people call it Michigan U-turn because it's mostly Michigan. And they have these uh, all across, they have a thousand miles in their system. They built them back in the 60s, so it's nothing new. But uh, they, have, they take their major corridors like this, and the trick to it is, is as you approach the intersection, you're not allowed to turn left. What you do is you turn right to go left. Sounds a little strange, but, but as you come up to the intersection, you're guided to turn right, to go up, to, up in the wrong direction for about 500 feet, and come to this U-turn movement and come back to the intersection. Now, it's not your normal U-turn, real tight U-turn that maybe you're accustomed to. It, it, this has got a wider, obviously a wider boulevard to it, so U-turns are a little more uh, a little more easy to do. And it's also a signalized, system, a very um, coordinated signal system that helps those movements be made. But what the, the benefit does is, so that's, that's coming from the cross street, and then if you're on the arterial and you want to turn left, you go past the main intersection, use that same U-turn crossover, and come back. So again, it's used all over the place in Michigan. There's a few applications throughout, um, but it mainly in Michigan is known for it. And here's a video to, sh to show you uh, the, the oper operational benefits. This is the main line going. And we're going to stop, you know, people are going to have to stop in the street anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop them back here. So these people now are waiting to go back here. And we use that time for these U-turns to service through. So they get to go through the signal at the same time that this cross street is going through. So these people come, they turn right. And some of them make it all the way, some of them may not, but they, they get to go through and kind of filter in. And then when we release this, these people back here, it's coordinated with this one, we release them here. And so this, this, these, these people have, can go straight through. So to, to the person on the arterial, it's great because I, I, I still have to stop once, but I only have to stop once. Uh, you know, some people complain about you know, entering the, the system that you now I gotta go a little extra movement and drive a little farther. But overall, the benefits are so, so great that if you make this a regular intersection, you know, lots of congestion. Uh, in Michigan, you've seen a lot of these where they've solved, uh, solved some major corridors. This is one of my favorite slides because this illustrates the, how, the confidence Michigan has. And this is an intersection of two, actually you can see there are two uh, median U-turn roadways meeting together. Both of them have median U-turns on them. It's that great. And this here happens to be the world, case, world, head for, world headquarters for Kmart. Uh, I know I met some more before Martha Stewart and all that, but anyways, it's the Kmart's up there. You got a mall here. Uh, about 100, uh, about 1.2 million square foot mall with a catwalk across to another 800,000 square foot mall. So about 200, 2 million square foot of mall and another 15 story office tower there. And all of this is built around an at grade intersection. Yes, it gets congested in the PMP, but it doesn't break down and it doesn't require an overpass. So, you know, and, and when you have the meaning of two streets, it's interesting, you can actually go a couple different ways. If you're on this street, you can go past and come back, or you can turn right and go this way. So you kind of have some options. The other thing, beauty about the Michigan U-turn, median U-turn design is it's, it's an active management tool. Because all movements that come out to the, to the arterial all have to turn right, the left turns. So someone's coming out of this complex here, he has to turn right, and then he goes and he crosses over the lanes, so he has to find a gap and cross over the lanes, and he makes a U-turn and comes back. So it takes away some safety, it, 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 it provides some safety benefits on the, uh, the arterial as well, and helps, you know, have some, uh, helps some of those movements. Now, it does require, with balance like this, it does require a pretty wide, a pretty wide uh, footprint. Um, and a long time ago, uh, this is in the Green Book, it's been in the Green Book since the 60s, uh, they, they put you know, how wide does it have to be. You know, if you're, it depends on your design vehicle, it depends on how many lanes you're turning, but roughly you need at least a 50 to 60 foot medium to make the to be successful. So not all places have that, so that's a drawback to that. But some, there are some quarters out there that have wide mediums, and some that even be, uh, bulb outs to reduce that width a little bit, but it's, it's sort of a you know drawback to that design. I mentioned uh, other places have it. Well, you know, what, I don't know if you guys do, but you've got one in Texas now. They just opened this one in uh, about six months ago in the city of Plano, Texas. This is the this is the design how it used to be. Now this is it's kind of a strange intersection. It looks like it was set up as almost like a, uh, a split diamond. I'll talk about that one later. Uh, intersection, and they converted it to a median U-turn. You can see all the stuff in the white here is basically the improvements they made. There's probably no more than a million or two dollars in improvements. But so now they require, instead of having 
people able to turn left directly. Uh, people coming this way, see before, they would turn directly left. They come down, they turn right, they go up the road, and then come down and turn left that way. You can see a picture of after it's open. And if you go on the website, you know, there's some, you know, some people would say, it's great, you know, fix their problems. Other people say, why are you making it go you know, further than I, than I need to? So there's sort of mixed bag that opens. But what we're not seeing is any, uh, any accident spike. There's no additional accidents, and then probably likely we'll see them drop over time. And no one's really complaining about the congestion levels as much anymore. So it's, you know, you got to you know, play cards right and look at each case individually. But there's some places like City of Plano that, that did this and successfully. And, and note, too, that this is only one intersection. They didn't do a whole corridor. They just targeted this design for one intersection. I, I believe it works better if you have a whole corridor of this, this type of program. But it could be just a single intersection uh, if you so choose. A, a close cousin to the Michigan U-turn is called the Super Street. This is the one I think I mentioned that my professor got on TV talking. They're talking about getting the left turns. And uh, this one's more relatively new. They, they've been a couple signs out there. This one happens to be in North Carolina. Uh, they've done a lot in Maryland and some other places. And it, it, again, it's the same kind of principle is that you, you turn right to go left. But what it does is it, 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 you can you now have a direct left in, but not out. So what it does is it creates two sets of signals, one here and one here that are tied together. And these two signals are tied together. But these two aren't at all. So you can actually have, you can progress traffic in both directions uh, perfectly without, without having to stop the other direction. So it's, um, well, I think I got a video that can kind of explain it again. Here's the same kind of video. See, once again, as this traffic progresses here, well, this traffic starts here, it catches the green here, and it catches the green here and goes. So it's spinning. Um, so they can go through, and at the same time, you can have people waiting to turn directly left in. They just have to go out. Now, where this design doesn't work is where you have a lot of through traffic. Because now through traffic also has to do something like this. But if you've got a mall over here and a residential subdivision here and you don't have a lot of through traffic, this design is great. So sometimes you'll see a mixture, a hybrid of BDU turns and super streets and different intersections. But it, but it does require the same kind of wider median and some of the U turn movements you make. But it's very intuitive to the driver. Uh, they, they might want to complain about it, but, they, but it's not, not unintuitive to, to, because you're still turning left from the left side. The other big benefit that these have, and if any of you are going to, anyone going to TRB next week, um, there's the same guy, my professor is, is, is giving a paper presentation on the Super Street, and they've done a lot of research on, on rural locations. Um, his name's Joseph Hummer, by the way. Uh, but it's not uh, but uh, the, the, there's a lot of benefits to rural locations uh, because, uh, for safety. This, this was one such location where before they had this, this crash site, and no one could quite pinpoint why it's such a high crash site. You can see over, over uh, a couple, three years, they had 24 crashes and one fatality on the crashes. So they put in the Super Street in a year and a half, and it's not a complete data set, but they put it a year and a half after, they had a grand total of two. So they substantially decreased the number of accidents because, again, you eliminated some of those, those high-speed T-bone type maneuvers and people you know, just go along. You know, and all of these movements are unsignalized. You don't have to signalize them. Uh, unless the volume is dictated to, but this is an uncivilized condition that, that allows that super street movement into the side street. So um, stay, stay tuned and look for those papers from, from uh, Dr. Hummer and the TRB to look at it more. Um, New Jersey took the complete opposite approach. Mich Michigan had these, these super quarters uh, uh, reserved right away, and they had these 200 foot right away quarter reserved that, that gave them the ability to, to, to do the meeting turns. New Jersey did not have that ability, they widened in. So what they did is they took their four-lane arterials that had a grass beacon and they just widened in to create the jug handle design. And how jug handles work is basically there's, there's a barrier down, down the middle. And you've all heard the term Jersey barrier. Um, guess where it comes from? New Jersey. Uh, because they have miles and miles and miles of this Jersey barrier that separates the, the roadways. So, so they don't allow those turns. So what they do is they, they, they these jug handle designs, are almost like at-grade interchanges. Um, some, of them, some of them operate like, a, uh, like an off-ramp. and they, So you turn left, you get off, and turn left. Some of them, when the left turn volume gets high enough, then you put a loop in at grade. And then mid-block, sometimes they have these just mid-block crossings, so anyone going to go over here just uses the, the U-turn and mid-block U-turn area along the corridor. And they have, again, just like Michigan, they did miles and miles of these. You go from Trenton down to uh, Philadelphia area, there's 30 mile corridors that just all, all meeting you turn. And, and you see some of the photos. It's, it's not exactly the most attractive thing we've ever seen. Uh, it's a Jersey barrier, but it's, but it's very effective in, in, again, access management. Don't have left turns coming out and uh, added capacity when they didn't have room to widen the outside. Here's just a couple of pictures of the, the geometries they have at the different locations. 
and not like jug handles. All right, those, so those are more of the corridor-based solutions. Let's look at a couple of specific intersection-based solutions. And this, is, this one made its rounds about two, two, three years ago. Maybe you've heard the term continuous flow intersection. It kind of got this buzzword because it finally came to America after being developed in, uh, in other places like Mexico and some of the South American regions. Uh, the guy, Francisco Meyer, uh, developed the concept and he's implemented in many other places, just not in the U.S. So we finally got to, we finally got to developing them and um, you know, won an Astro Award. And this one, this one basically creates left, um, creates protected and through and left turn movement simultaneously. And how it does it looks a little strange, but what it does is it basically takes the left turn movement that normally would turn left here, and it pulls them out in advance and in a signalized location. It pulls them out and puts them in from a storage bay here, so that when this when this phase gets its green, it's on the outside, so your left turns can just turn left unopposed. And it does the same thing on the other direction. So it's a, a laws again back to your two phase operation. It allows in both directions. And we now have about a uh, half dozen in the country. Um, I've got a couple slides I'll show you, but there's uh, about a half dozen of them, and they've all worked reasonably well. Uh, one, one of the first ones was on a college campus, so it doesn't really count. Uh, but this one uh, was in Maryland on a major state route, and actually the volumes on this, they have about, it's a T intersection, and they have about 2,800 lefts. That, that's a lot of left turns. That's really a through move. It's a triple left, but they're able to accomplish that because they pull out the, the left turn beforehand. So again, the main signal, you only have you know, this direction and the left turn. So they will run that cycle a long time and get like level service C at this intersection with 2,800 lefts, uh, which is unheard of. In fact, this, this one was the first bill that got a lot of attention because everyone said, well, no, you've got to come in and put it on a flyover. And they designed this flyover at $7 million to build a, a flyover so they could drive that movement. And there's, you can see there's some, some wetlands and some you know, preserve areas. Everyone kind of got skittish about it. So, so Francisco came and said, well, I got a great idea for you. Let's try this. And after a lot of, uh, of discussion about it, they finally built one, and it, it works great. So, um, so that was our first, well, first T intersection in, in America. And there were some others that were built since before that. Here's, here's the, again, the video operation. And, and if you look at it from the air, it looks really kind of weird. You've got a lot of movements going around. You're thinking, wow, this is going to be hard to figure out. But if you put yourself in the driver's seat and how you would drive this thing, it's really not that confusing because you're, 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 basically, pull, you're basically given when, when, when this traffic is going here, this traffic is allowed to pull across and, and store in here. And then when this lane turns go in this direction, these left turns can just proceed outside here. Now your right turns kind of have to be channelized and you, you got to do some stuff with your right turns now. And also access to the, the quadrants gets a little more difficult because you, got, you, can't, you can't provide access you know, right in this area because you're kind of going the wrong way. But, so that's, that's a challenge, this one as well, access management. But as an overall picture, uh, it has tremendous capacity benefits. And you run analysis on these, just phenomenal what they can do, because if you think about it, you're giving your left turns as much green time as your through movements. So you've got a lot of extra capacity for this intersection, uh, even though it requires bigger footprint and has some, some access management challenges. Again, one you know, something for everyone. Um, we're starting to look at now hybrid type designs. And my company is doing a, a design for Virginia Beach. Where they liked the immediate turn and the uh, and the uh, continuous flow, and said, "Well, why don't we build a hybrid one?" And that's essentially what they did. And it's, it's, it's a hybrid design where on this leg, uh, as you can see, they've got the, the U turns because they had the wider median, and then on this leg they did not have as much room, so they did the, the crossovers for the continuous flow. And it actually worked it out. So that on their phases, the first phase would be kind of your through traffic there, and you allow your left turns here, and on your second phase kind of allow all your U-turn movements and whatnot. So again, still two-phase operations, uh, you know, different approaches in each, each direction, but if it's signed and done right, you know, motorists will, will understand it pretty easy. And, and they're able to accomplish it in a very tight uh, footprint so they didn't have the right way to do it, anything else. Question? It seems a, maybe a bit challenging for pedestrians. How do they, or are you covering that later? Uh, well, I, I can cover, actually, to tell you about pedestrians. Uh, let's see if my best slide to do that. Well, for example, uh, let me go back to the meeting terms. Let's see. Pedestrian, yeah, well, if, if, pedestrians. Okay. Uh, when, when pedestrians want, want to cross the street, oftentimes on a meeting turn, they, they do it in two phases. Because they can cross over here where this traffic is going, just like normal. And if, if they have enough time, they can make it all the way across or they can store in this wide median to go across. Uh, this or the same on this direction as well. So pedestrians have a mixed, mixed bag on, on some of these. This point of the median turn. Looks like they have a pedestrian branch. Uh, well, uh, on the mall, yes, because this is this is all regional mall that they've connected. Uh, but for, for normal pedestrians walking, they don't. Um, and 
don't think they're necessarily warranted. But again, going back to the principle is if you're if you're removing conflict points for vehicles, you're also removing vehicle pedestrian conflicts. So he, so and so here also pedestrians only are looking one way. They don't have to cross all the way over the street, looking both ways, so they're a little more protected. So it's it's a mixed bag. I won't tell you that all of these are pedestrian friendly. I tell them most of them aren't pedestrian, aren't pedestrian unfriendly. But they may may require you to do a couple different things once you as you look through them. Now, I'll, I'll try and highlight those as I go through. The flow one. That, that is that is that is a challenging one, and uh, yeah, that is a more challenging one. And and, prop, and that that design is probably meant for more of a suburban area where you don't have high volumes of pedestrians. Um, I don't think I have a slide that shows you the pedestrians there. But, so. All right. Um, next one. You know, this this one actually this had to be my uh, graduate thesis. Uh, for, for, uh, when I went to North Carolina State, um, I put together this new kind of intersection called the Quadra Roadway. And I, I it got published in the IT Journal 10 years ago. So I'm actually giving an update at the uh, Southern District IT meeting on you know, what's happened in the last 10 years. And this is called the Quadra Roadway. This one is really meant for a very urbanized or suburban area where you can't widen the street. And, and basically what happens here is, we, we, again, we have no left turns in the main intersection. But we have one roadway that either in some, in some places exists, or when you build a, a roadway in one quadrant, that handles all your left-hand turns. For example, if you're on the main road, and, and it's when you want to go left here, you go past the intersection, turn right, kind of make the, the jokey hands road you turn. If you're going the other direction, you turn advance, and you turn left again, and signalize intersections. If you're on the, this street, you, you, you can, same thing, you turn either advance, or kind of beyond. So this is a mixed bag of how many people turn, but you can see on all these approaches, we widen any streets. In fact, we probably gain some area uh, in the you know, left turn days. But we, uh, we use this roadway to do that. And um, here's, here's a, again, a video clip of how that's done. And again, same principle of where you can, it's where are we stopping people. Like for instance, if you're on the main drive here, well, while, this, while, while this roadway is, is okay, while well, this roadway is going, this intersection here can, can do its, its movements because again, we're stopping people here that would otherwise be stopped here. So we're just sort of allowing them to fill in that bay. And then when this traffic is released here, these people should kind of hit the back of that queue and then go proceed. So now we've got these people going. We have a little bit of time here to, to allow this left to finish. And now these folks can kind of come through and join this queue. So it's again, just where you're stopping people and, allow, and using some of the extra room in here now to handle your left turn movements. The other thing I tell people about this roadway is to think about, if you think about 300 lefts, uh, 300 left turns an hour is a decent size left turn volume. It's where we, as traffic engineers, usually say, let's put a double left. Okay. 300 lefts is a lot less, but 300 throughs in an hour, that's, that's not a lot of volumes for a single lane roadway to handle. So we're, we're, we're kind of shifting the load from, rather than from me taking up the time to, to, to service them here, we're, we're servicing them over here and, and displacing that so we're able to unlock the intersection. And so again, this was a good one for an you know, urbanized area. Again, it's, it's, if you've got a roadway, a lot of places have these kind of roadways through shopping centers or something that maybe you could cobble together. I've actually looked at a few in Georgia where we have a shopping center here. We approach the shopping center and say, hey, I just kind of put a road through your shopping center that will bring people closer to your doors, but we'll, we'll reserve it as a as main road. And they're kind of receptive to it. Something different. Or maybe the road doesn't exist in the greenfield and you can build it. So it's just one of those uh, newer ones that they have. And we, again, are just doing a design build for the build very first. Uh, quite a way I can do it, actually. Is there an option of distance yes. the package road? Yes. Uh, this, thank you, uh, going back here. This is about the same as the as the median U-turn. This is about 500 feet. So you're asking people to go 500 feet further, maybe 1,000 feet plus further than they would normally go. But the time is, is greatly improved. So, and, and often, too, motorists, if they're, if they're moving, they don't realize delay as much as sitting. So we're not only reducing the time they, they sit, but you know, they're kind of moving as they do it too as well, so it doesn't quite feel as like I'm stuck waiting for a light for forever. But yeah, the optimal is, is like five to maybe six, uh, 600 feet. Uh, if you get too far, then yeah, we're, we're taking, well, you know, can't take a mile out of the way. And if you're too close, you don't have enough storage, so yeah, there has to be kind of that sweet spot in there for, for a lot of these. This is the first partial uh, quad roadway that's being built in Huntersville, North Carolina. It's really close to the, the interstate ramp, and they were having a lot of problems with the, the signal coming off the interstate ramp, and a lot of people want to turn left. So now people are going to be turning left and then to kind of make the right to go around. Um, we did a lot of work on what the signing should be for, for these kind of designs. Because this one is a little different in that we're actually asking people to turn left from the right lane. In other words, it's, they're not making a you know, left turn direction kind of coming and making a right turn, which is a little bit counterintuitive. 
So he said, well, maybe we need to put a, you know, some, some overhead signs to say, you know, this is the way to go north and that kind of thing. And so we're experimenting with how that's received and it should be open this summer and we'll have a little more data on, on driver expectations for that. I uh, mentioned this, the split intersection earlier that you saw in Plano. This is very similar to this. This is actually its own kind of design called the split intersection. And what basically it does is it, 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 it at the intersection, it bows out wide so that you have sort of a diamond interchange operation. You actually provide lefts here. Uh, and then what, what, what the benefit of this one is usually is that you can come back later. It's the first step that if you're going to build a freeway or build an overpass, uh, you can build this at grade. And then if, if or when traffic gets too high, you can simply come back and put in the bridge structure and have almost zero throwaway costs. And in fact, that's what actually Tel Aviv and Israel did. They developed this whole system of these uh, split intersections with the intent of going back and putting in bridges. And they found that, and they did this back in the 80s, they found they really didn't need to put the, the overpasses in for a lot longer than they thought. I think they're starting to go back now, but it's been, you know, they thought maybe five years they'll come back and build overpasses. They never had to because it operated so much better. And then just like, the, just like they did in Plano, this, this design allows you to go several different steps. You can start out with a split intersection, and then you can move and add the median U-turns, or you can do the, the complete. So it's, a, so it's a really good planning tool where you can say, well, maybe I don't trust my future volumes, planners, uh, don't trust my future volumes all that much, and maybe the wheel and the molten overpass. This would be a first step to that, and so you know, not much throwaway costs. Okay, and we also went down a, a proposed, this is another lesson about making sure you're getting, uh, getting into these relevant planning stage. Because I came down uh, to uh, Naples, Florida. That's a great place to go, especially in the winter time. Um, but they have they have an intersection where they have issues, and, and the uh, there's a little contention between the, the city government and the county. Uh, the county was dead set about building this this um, uh, forty million dollar interchange. This was back uh, back in two thousand five when there still was money. But they, they had this really exotic. You know, it was a beautiful uh, interchange, and actually they did build it, so it's it's, it's fine. But they spent forty million dollars on it. And we proposed that you could build this split intersection that would, we thought would reduce their traffic and said, well, if we're wrong, you can always come back and put in the overpass and reduce cost and that kind of thing. And, 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 they, and they really started to see the wisdom to it, but the problem was it was already in contracts and they already had, uh, you know, it became political. And so, you know, a good solution maybe just wasn't timely enough to really become reality. So I tell people, if you think about these well in the planning stages, if you don't get down the road where the, the contractors are like ready for their final design plans and you're changing things and that's not good. But, but if you think about them, all well, in the planning stage, then maybe you could do something. And, we, uh, and so, uh, of course, you can't talk about unconventional without talking about roundabouts. Uh, I don't know about roundabouts, how well they're received here. Different parts of the country have different objections to them. We are seeing a lot more of them throughout the country, but they, they do that same thing. Is they, they, they remove the left turn and make it go around the circle. Um, there has been a lot of just improvements in general, and the modern roundabout design can handle a lot of traffic. They're not for everywhere, but in some places that make great sense. Uh, the safety records speak for themselves. So if you have a, if you have a high crash area, in fact, we in Georgia are now <coughs> mandated to look at roundabouts whenever we look at intersection improvements, just as an option. You don't have to select them, but we say, look at that. It's almost your first your, your first crack because you know they can be easier easier to maintain. You don't have to power them. You, you, know, you don't have to worry about uh, um, you know, crash issues go down. Do they make sense? If not, okay, but at least think about it. So. Uh, but that's all I'll say on roundabouts. <coughs> Although you can take round, the roundabout principle and apply it to this uh, conventional, and this uh, again we came up with uh, a bow tie intersection. Uh, for those of you who wear bow ties and you know, have the uh, idea of what that looks like, um, uh, that, that instead of being able to turn left, you turn right, you go down uh, maybe a few hundred feet, four or five hundred feet, and then use this roundabout to finish your left hand turn. So if you have like a, a so if you're in a, have some local streets or some, some collector streets that here that go through and have a roundabout, you know, maybe at your intersection you could just eliminate the left turns and make them do the roundabout thing and use that. So it's a, another kind of inexpensive way to do it. Uh, you, know, you know, it's really good when you have a narrow street and you can't widen the arterial. Uh, so. Okay, now let's, let's talk about some now some great separations. So say you have an intersection that you know, maybe none of these still work or fit or whatnot, you, you don't need to grade separate. But there's, there, there are other ways to do it than just build your standard diamond. Uh, there's an innovative way that, that, that contextually fit better than maybe your standard diamond. And, and I mentioned contextual. Oh, um, you're talking about, and, and I call them grade separated intersections rather than interchanges because when you say interchange, this may, I think of like freeways and, 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 and wide diamonds and all that kind of stuff. And this is really more just contextual to the environment for suburban areas where you don't have room for big interchanges and loop ramps and all that kind of stuff. 
So we, you know, in, in, in that kind of environment, you usually have motors that are a little more attentive, and we design freeways for like the brain dead person who just, you know, last minute wants to get off, and you know. But this is more people are paying attention to the urban area. They have sort of different expectations, and and um, and aesthetics and land value are, are definitely big factors in these kind of locations. So, and, and the other part about it is too, it's a lot of people come in and build an interchange. And that might be great for that intersection and solve that. But what do you do? You just move the bottleneck down to the next interchange. And so you end up spending millions of dollars chasing or planning to chase the problem. And it doesn't do a whole lot of good. So we look at designs that sort of fit into the signalized network that, that proceeds away from the interchange. So the first one, talk about contextual. Oh, actually, hold on. This is the part of the newest one that people have been hearing about and sort of the buzzword here is the diverging diamond interchange. How many of you heard about the diverging diamond interchange? Okay. All right, well, cool. For those of you who have it, this is kind of fun. Um, it's, it's a new principle uh, that was developed in France. And uh, this, this was the first one built in France. And it looks kind of weird. Um, it, it, it is, they do drive on our side of the road, so it's not that. But, but the issue of this one is that what happens is if you come to our interchange, and instead of uh, instead of you'll turn left, you actually cross over and you drive on the wrong side of the road across the, across the bridge and then come back across. And so what that allows you to do is you can have a direct left-hand turn that, or right-hand turn this way, and then when you cross over, then you have an unopposed left-hand turn. So from an operational standpoint, it sounds great, but the issue is how do you handle these crossover points? The first example is in France, and it's not a very good example of how you handle the crossover points, because you can see here, they're almost nil. There's no geometric deflection. There's nothing that, that helps people guide the path. Uh, you know, despite being, I think, a really horrible design, you got a roundabout up here. This is just, you know, it's kind of it, 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 a bad example. If I show you the video, you'd say, you're never going to build one of those. But, but despite that, they, they put this at their worst accident location in France, and they cut the accidents in half. Okay, so there is some safety benefit to it. I don't know how, how there, but, um, but. What, what the real, real benefit to this is, is if you have a bridge that you, you, you don't want to widen or don't have the funds to widen, you don't have to widen the bridge. You can turn a four lane, you know, you can turn some lanes and, and make it through, through lanes, you don't have to widen bridges. And that's exactly what Missouri got interested in doing. The, this was the first planned one in the United States that was going to be built by Missouri. And they had this, these two bridges here that they didn't want to replace because it would cost them about $11 million. So they look at alternatives, and we, uh, 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 this was designed, the diverse down was designed, and it, and it had a cost of about half of that. So it left the bridges in place, and left that you know, maintenance of traffic on the, on the interstate of the, uh, a mess. And they designed this so that you could cross over and cross back. Now you can see, when we designed it now, you get a lot more deflection in the roadways, so that when they come together, you get a little bit more of a, it's not quite 90 degrees, but you can get a little better, so that the intersection's a little better there. But the big thing is, is these are a great way to save, save some money. That uh, Missouri did end up the very first one. Although now that was in St. Louis, this is in Springfield. And I kind of got the idea that if they built in Springfield, and it didn't work, that no one would know. So, but um, anyway, so they, they took this this roadway. This was the pre uh, pre picture of it. Uh, it was just a, just a standard five lane crossing the bridge. Uh, people want to widen the bridge, it's expensive and whatnot. And this is the, the after photo. Um, it took them a whole grand six months to build the thing because it really isn't. I mean, it's, it's rebuilding the intersections and whatnot, um, and it cost them a whole three million dollars rather than, again, $10 million or $8 million to build conventional diamond, rebuild the conventional diamond. Um, as you can see from the video here, I'll show you the videos. This is an actual operation. You can see how, see how the vehicles cross over, um, and, then, and then they're making their left-hand turn directly, and they cross back. Uh, it's, it's actually, a, there's a lot of trucks in this area. It's a, sort of a truck terminal area, so there's a lot of trucks. In fact, you see these two trucks side by side here. On the second here, they'll take off, and they can, they can actually, here they go. The, the two trucks will go side by side. This actually was before they even put the arrest of the medians in. That, 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 that was filled in by a median, but I guess they got barrels in for now. You see the trucks come over, they go side by side, go across the bridge, and come back across and go through. So again, all two phase operations. Uh, while, while, and while this, this, this movement's going this way, then you can have your left turns from, from the interstate coming in across here. It's, it's actually kind of split phasing. You actually have this side of the arterial go, and then the other side of the arterial go, and the ramps fit in between. So, and, and actually, going back to your pedestrian issue, you know, let me just play the video events one, one more time. Oops. Just saying, go forward. Sorry. Your pedestrian issue on this. Notice how there's this gap in between the two roadways? That's your pedestrian corridor. So basically, what was the left-hand turn bay is a pedestrian corridor. So you see pedestrians kind of crossing. They can cross here this ramp. Then they cross this traffic here, again, while this traffic is going. 
they go up up the middle of the bridge and then cross back across. So it is a two-stage crossing, it's a little different, but they're all protected, for the most part protected crossings, and then people are kind of aware of them as they're going through. So you sort of have to work with that. And, and there is still the argument about do you put them on the outside or the inside. I, I, I like it this way, that you can't put them on the outside, but since you're trying to spread it apart, you have more room on the outside than on the inside, so they just have the pedestrian corridor working through it. I think it's about a seven foot walkway or so, and this isn't particularly attractive one, but they, they build that way. So again, it's very good to save money. Bikes? And, 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 so, that be bikes? Bikes, pedestrian, yeah, everyone goes, yeah, well, I guess a bicyclist can go with traffic because they, they do, this is a slow speed movement. They try and limit the speeds, because the curves to go through, so you could, could bike it, like, like a roundabout to take the lane. Um, it's funny, if you, if you go to um, YouTube and Google uh, Diverse Diamond, you'll see these great videos and there's some of these, you know, these like teenage girls going, all right, go see the drive the Diamond, you know, they're all excited about it, like it's some ride. So they get in the thing and they drive through it and they're like, oh, that was it? Like for sure, you know, I mean, they're, 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 you know, you think of it like, wow, I'm driving on the wrong side of the road, but if you, you know, strike it and mark it correctly, you know, at night it's a challenge because you kind of feel like you're on the wrong side of the road and you sort of follow the traffic, it's, it's not that different. Um, but it just does wonders. And this, like I said, this, this was a very congested intersection. And they said they were amazed when they opened up the first day. They're like, where did the traffic go? And it just, it just dissipated because it's, it was so efficient and uh, getting used to it. So it's, 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 there's actually now three built in the United States. Uh, well, two in Missouri and one in Tennessee. Did they keep the bridge? They kept the bridge. That's, that's, that's the exact same bridge that was there before. So they didn't have to replace any part of the bridge. And you know, the other one went underneath the bridge, and you could do that as well. Um, so. Another another contextual design is called. I do have time. Okay. Um, it's called the Echelon Interchange. It's the only one of its kind. It's in um, it's in um, Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And and how this works is basically you take two two arterials and you you grade separate half of them. So one approach goes up, the other stays down. So what happens is you end up with a meeting of two one-way streets, one on top and one below. And this came around by this project because they had this pretty nasty project of, uh, they have a lot of issues, they have a rail crossing here, they have uh, a school, a shopping center, a lot, of, a lot of environmental concerns, and they, they 10 years they spent studying this, this design. Someone came up with this echelon design, and it was so done because the guy was a fire pilot, and, and the echelon formation, how pi uh, planes fly like this over top of each other, kind of gave him the idea, and so they proposed this. And, and, and the beauty about this one is it, it meters all traffic. You know, both, both directions have a traffic signal, whether you're up or down, but both, both are single phase and they're basically one-way streets. So while you still can meter traffic, um, then it, but, it's still, uh, but it still provides benefit for capacity. In fact, um, here's, here's the video of it again. The stuff in red would be kind of what's elevated. And you can see that basically what happens is one side of the interior goes up on this side, and they, and they have a one-way street, and left turns are opposed, and they come down. Of course, you do have sort of a, a left merge down here, and down here is a left merge. Um, but it's up in the air, and the other one is below grade and, and does its thing. So it's sort of two one-way streets. It's not cheap. Uh, it, it's probably not any cheaper than building a regular interchange. Uh, maybe even more expensive, but again, in this particular environment, it was the only thing that worked. And here you can see the photos, it you know, kind of goes up in about a block spacing. You know, you have up top, and it's very, uh, very uh, intuitive for motorists because we're not changing anything about the motorists. When they go up in the air, they still turn right or left, just like they would do when they go straight down. And then when, once you come down from these things, you go right into a very busy urban, urban network the very next the intersection is triple S. So if we just flushed all the traffic through this one, they would just you know, create a problem there. But we, we fixed this interchange greatly, and then, then it just moved, the, but the, it still didn't just move the bottleneck. There's still some, some, some metering of the, of the uh, design. So it just really fit beneath this one. And this might be the only one ever built, but, but it's you know, interesting that. Uh, John, question. Sorry, sorry. Does that rail crossing affect the, the other moving traffic? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it can. Yeah, it, it, the roads that are down are unfortunately affected by grades, but it's, it's not a real, real, real busy line. But yeah, it's it's not perfect um, because you have adequate crossings. But um, going back to Michigan, the, this is the same Michigan U-turn form and interchange. It sort of looks like a reverse of the Texas diamond here. Instead of the U-turn being this way, it's actually this way. And so, just like the median U-turn, they turn right to go left, and then they get on the freeway. Go there. Again, this one, I actually watched this one get built. I, I lived here, went to college here, and they would actually they, they would build these two bridges first, and so they would kind of take traffic around and build the main bridge. It was you know, some good construction phasing. Um, but the end, end result got me thinking another project in land where we had, uh, and we coined this uh, uh, interchange called the dual system urban interchange, um, and the, the GF project manager and I color with paper and for TRB. But what this does is, is we, we were at, at a location where we had, we had managed lanes. 
and we wanted to, to intersect them with the cross streets. And that can be very problematic if you have too many ramps and trying to get everyone into one intersection. So I said, what if we take that footprint of the median U-turn intersection, so again, general purpose traffic you know, kind of does this, and then use those two new crossings to be how, how HOV traffic comes up to the surface. So if you're in the HOV lanes, you come up to a T-ramp, and then you enter into this kind of almost one-way system. So you could come up and turn right, or come up and, and do a left. So it's a way to integrate both, uh, both edge lane and general purpose into one interchange, which is otherwise, I, I don't think it's been done. I've seen other attempts to try and do something like that, but this was mm -hmm. one. So, and, and again, it really fit the bill because there are a lot of people saying, well, we can't build the interchange here, or we've got to build somewhere else, and there are no good locations. And, and so it just worked out that we, we uh, that now, fortunately, the project isn't built the way it is, so it, it kind of is a moot point. But it, the paper's out there now, and the idea's out there that someone else building really managed lanes. I talked to Chuck Hughes a lot from my office. He's, talks about that other projects that uh, he does on HIV projects that, that could, could have potential somewhere else. Uh, yeah, there, there's footprint actually, <laughs> and the interchange we were replacing was a was a full uh, clover system to system interchange, uh, and we, we said, well, you know, you can replace all this. And there's like something like 22 acres that we can give back. And I said, I'd like to sell the sell the land and then help pay for the interchange. But anyways, we, we could replace a very misplaced. Uh, System to system interchange because this, this roadway really isn't uh, the cross street really isn't a freeway it's just a busy arterial so we can replace it with a more urbanized form a much much smaller footprint uh, for the project so I think I have a video on that one uh, a couple last real quick almost done um, the, this is something called the center turn overpass this one was done uh, created by an electrical engineer in, in Florida and um, you know I guess the electrical engineers get business too. Uh, he said, what, what about the idea of just taking all your left-hand turns up to an, and to an intersection on top that's just all your left turn movements? So you have these very slender ramps that may fit to a median, um, and basically you go up, and, and then you have a two-phase signal up here, because it's just left turns, and at the bottom you don't have your left turns anymore, so it's, it's so, it, it, you know, where he left the reservation, he said, well, you know, you could, you could prefab these off-site and just kind of helicopter in and drop them in and go to them again. But one hasn't been built yet. This is one of those that's out there. It's an idea. It just hasn't found its home yet. But again, it has a great, you know, a lot of advantages for left turns, and you could do it in a very narrow, narrow footprint. I've got the video next. See how kind of slender because you only have the only single lanes. You come up, and you just everyone's turning left, and uh, it kind of can be done in almost a, a regular median of a roadway. Um, the contraflow left inner. Change. I'm working on one of these in Augusta, Georgia. In Augusta, Georgia. They can build it anywhere. Um, it's uh, it was done in Florida, and it's, it's sort of similar to the uh, divergent diamond. Although we don't go all the way across. What happens is, is at, at a tight diamond interchange, you take your left turn traffic out on the opposite side of your other left hand turn traffic. So you're kind of switching, switching around. So that way you don't have to have back to back left turn bays you know, in between. Your left turns are out here, and these can go at the same time. So it eliminates that phase. And it, it, the first one we've done was done 20 years ago, and it was meant to be a, they said, well, you know, we're gonna replace this structure in ten, five years, okay, I heard that for. So let's do this temporary improvement until, until it gets rebuilt. Well, 20 years later, they finally replaced the bridge, and in, in, in an interim time, it worked fine. And so Florida has since built some new ones, this, this from scratch, or retrofitted other intersections, and they're, and they're particularly problematic when you have very tight space diamonds. And here's, the, here's a photo of, of, of the site uh, the left turn lanes brought out, and you can see, you can see here, the left turn lanes on the outside here, the outside here, and so it allows them to go back, back. And here's this is the one I don't have the video running. This is in uh, Fort Lauderdale. We had, there were frontage roads looked very well. We have frontage roads. Uh, we do have those Texas U turns in there too, but uh, the frontage road where, where it's hard to see, but you pull left hand turns out on this side, and this left turn lane goes on this side, and they can run them together. Otherwise, it'd be a mess in between. So. I think I've got just, I, I threw in the single point only to illustrate you, you all have single points in Texas, I think. Okay, well, so most of us have single points. Um, Actually, there's one in uh, 1960. They've been around for a while. In fact, they, they, you remember the original ones were called Griner interchanges because Griner developed them and they were, but I like single point better. Uh, but anyways, they, they built them back in the 70s and, and, and uh, I was doing the time, I kind of remember the mantra of, uh, you know, we're going to kill people because you know you can't fit this geometry, and people are going to crash us on. They finally opened one up. In fact, they had they had they had lights in the pavement, like almost like they're landing an airplane, to try and guide people because they figured 
and they just didn't have any accident experience. And then over time, and they got to be you know, so good as far as capacity wise go, and that, that people build them, and now they're routine. And so I say, you know, a lot of these unconventional designs now might be the conventional designs of the future, and that once people kind of get used to them and say, you build one, you see how it operates, you can go out the field and look at it like the diversion diamond, you can see it and say, deal, we're not seeing a lot of accidents, and they'll become more and more in, into your, your system. And so there are a lot of states that really prefer single points because you don't, instead of having two intersections you know, that you've got to coordinate, you bring it all to one point and operate that way. So there's some capacity benefits there. Uh, I won't talk about roundabout interchanges, <coughs> measure Texas, well, Texas diamonds, do level interchanges. So anyway, so there's, so there's a, at least I, I know of a, a, about 25, maybe 30 different kind of unconventional interchanges out there. And some, some uh, you know, been around since the 60s, like the Michigan. I mean, some are so brand new that you know, we only have videos, we only have you know, ideas of them yet. So it's, just, it's a mix of, of them out there. There's a lot of different ways to do precisely what we were talking about with the principles earlier, get rid of left-hand turns. So real quickly, if you'll ask, well, if I'm thinking about planning one of these, what, where, where do I get the best bang for the buck on that? And, and I'll tell people that if you have an intersection that has you know, 60 to 70,000 vehicles a day going through it, you probably, you know, I'm not talking about two arterials, you probably can just do traditional intersection improvements. It's not that many cars in the grand scheme of things. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can't widen, you gotta look unconventional, but you should be able to handle that. But, but when you get into that, you know, 80,000 to 120, 130, some of the intersections in Michigan carry 140,000 cars a day through an intersection, through a BBB turn or an unconventional intersection. That's where you start to get your real value for your buck because maybe your traditional uh, engineer would say, I gotta build an overpass to get to this level. You know, I can build something at grade that's usually, you save yourself right there, 10, 10 $15 million dollars time to build a structure and, and access management and all the other stuff that goes with overpasses. So that's, that's where you kind of get your bang for your buck. When you, get, when you get really high, like 130, 150,000 cars a day, then you start to look at, you know, you know interchange type or, or grade separate types, but there again, there's a lot of grade separated intersection types that don't make you build just diamonds and that maybe fit better in the context of your community. Um, real quickly, I developed a CD program for Maryland State Highway uh, that, that helped, helped them. They, they, they wanted to, they, they saw this program and they loved it and they said, well, how do we get our planners and our engineers kind of up to speed on this? So we created a, a CD um, for them that, that, that um, you can run. And basically what it does, it starts out and, and you can go through the concept principles uh, and you know, run through and you know, precisely kind of the things that you saw today, you know, why build them or whatnot. Um, and then you can go look at the different in intersection types. And let's say I want to learn more about the meeting you turn. So I click on that one, and then it gives me nothing. There we go. Yeah, it gives me the uh, it gives me the schematic of it. I can actually there's there's videos in here that show you the operation of all of them. An image library that's photos in the field. You know what does the signing look like? What do they look like? Uh, how will the design evolved? Any design operations uh, you know out there? Uh, how do you design them? Any studies or research done to show how they improve safety or capacity? Lessons learned from different places and, and locations where you can find them. And obviously, the, the, this information exists for varying, varying degrees for different kinds of intersections. Some have, you know, it's a great database. Some just have a few things because it's you know, not built yet. But we've gone through and done all of the intersections, uh, and so you can plan or something and say, I've never heard of a diverged diamond. You can at least get that, that information. They don't like reading a book, which I'd rather look at the CD too. But um, so, and then also, uh, it, uh, although it's, uh, we're still trying to develop the, the, the interactive part of it, where eventually, hopefully, we'll, we'll put in some basic parameters on an intersection. If you're looking to improve operations or safety or at grade or grade separated, you put in some, some, some characteristics and number of lanes and cross streets and signal information and uh, you know, your, your, your arterial width that you have, right of way, all that kind of stuff. And you put it all in and you, um, you know, scramble around in the program and kind of tell you which which intersections might be the most likely to be your solution. Now, it's not an element to replace an engineering solution. I want to keep my job. But uh, it, it, it does kind of tell you the ones that probably think about these and these don't work. Like, you know, like if you have more than 100,000 cars a day, you probably don't want to run, run some roundabouts. Um, you know, or if you have a uh, you know, 60 foot right away, you're not going to build a beam new turn. Because some of those are obvious. But then just sort of screen them. So the idea was someday, when it's, when it's completed, we would kind of rank the different unconventional designs so that the planner would come in and say, well, I'll look at the first five or six and see if they make sense. The, the other, the other uh, thing that we encourage people to do is to kind of think outside the box. Um, this. And, and I, I have, 
it's right now it's it's a CD program, and if you want a copy of this, the best way for me to do it is I, I can I can do it on an FTP site. It's a big program. It's about 250 megs, but I can actually FTP it to you. So at the end, you know, give me a business card, and I can. That's probably the best way to get. I, I didn't bring much CDs, but if you want the program, you just install it and run it, and it's all there. And let me know afterwards. But again, it, you know, encourage that that out of the box thinking as well. Um, I, I love to use traffic simulation tools. Like once I get an idea. Uh, you know, it's, it's this is a Vizin model, then a lot of Vizin modeling, uh, or Synchro, or any of the course M, or any kind of program that allows you to test and show uh, improvements. Because you know, a picture, a picture is a thousand words, and, and, and animation is ten thousand words. Because people can see the movements, and you can explain to people at public meetings, well, you know, your your path is going to change a little bit, but see the benefits to it, and you, you do a comparison before and after of the traffic congestion, and you can see the benefits to it, and, and kind of, and you can. Advance and, and uh, eliminate alternatives pretty quickly as you go through the process. Um, so when you finally get time to say, okay, I've got one that I want to design and implement, um, the first thing is clear and positive signing geometrics. It's worked. We've got a lot of over signing on going on there. If you read the sign, it's hilarious. It says semi tractors prohibited, no right term, trucks over two axles, except for trucks over 20,000 pounds, except during money. Like, you know, so what, what is the right sign? You know? So, it's, but you don't need any of that kind of sign. In fact, most most of these designs can be kind of fit within the, the the general theme of your state signing program. Or you could go to you know New Jersey has drug handle standards and Michigan has Michigan standards, and they can be adapted and to localize. So so there's no need to oversign, but you definitely want to want to definitely provide the adequate signage. So there's, there's a process you go through. You know, it's not necessarily reinvent the wheel. When also use the use the media, social media we have now to get those designs out there. You can put videos up on YouTube, and you can bring them to public meetings and do all kinds of fancy business and show people. Really show them how it works. Show them why it's better. Because you know, a lot of people come in and be naysayers, and they say, oh, I don't know, you're make me do all this." And then we kind of walk through the process. They at least understand. They don't, they don't all agree. At least they understand the process you've gone through and what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve. So that's a, a important a important part of it. And then also, you know, uh, use use a. Uh, Use cast love to pick up your videos and show them and, and show people how, how it's done. Um, when uh, you know, and, and as far as driver consistency, I mean, most most people drive kind of a herd instinct, where they'll follow the person in front of them, and you know, it's, you know, blood is fine, light all, it's, it's pretty easy. You really kind of kind of watch out. You got to watch out for uh, off peak, um, off peak movements and nighttime movements. Those could, because it, it, off peak, you maybe not have a car to follow. At nighttime, you've got different headlight things. You've got to think about how people are observing the, the operations. But, but what can look very complicated from a plan, you look down on it and say, that looks like spaghetti. You know, and drivers never going to understand it. But if you get yourself in the driver's seat and, and, and figure out what they're doing, and there's a lot of tools that can help visualize that process on how to play signs and pay parking, make sure people have that visual path, um, then, then people can get through these things without, uh, without fanfare. In fact, most of the designs that have opened, the continuous flows, the virgin diamonds, they have newscasters like on the spot. They're there waiting for the first accident. You know, they're saying, it's open, and we're just waiting for the carnage. And, and they really don't find there's, there's not a lot of hoopla to it. Motors just sort of get used to it. They, you know, sometimes they have police there at the spot, sometimes they don't, because they just, they just, you know, there, there, there's so many of these where they open a new design and they think, oh, this could be, it just sort of fizzles. The motors figure it out. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty bright these days. So, but you still, I mean, you still have to go through all your homework, and but most of the ones have opened. I don't know of anyone, except for roundabouts, there are, I don't know of any unconventional intersections that have been installed and ripped out because, you know, we realize it's the wrong thing, it was an accident. You know, the roundabouts are the case, sometimes people you know, get in there. Yeah, it's not their fault with you. But other, otherwise, other than that, they pretty much function pretty well. And, and sometimes you go back through and make minor geometric tweaks, but, but generally they, they live on. So, uh, to conclude, uh, I'll say that uh, you've seen, I hope you've seen that there's a host of different unconventional intersections out there. And, um, and, and even more out of the box thinking is necessary. That you mentioned the hybrid design that we're working on. Um, and, and no one design is a total solution. If you ask me, you know, what's, what's the best intersection out there, I, I couldn't tell you unless I knew specifics of your corridor, your community, your situation. So you really need to evaluate that. You can't just presuppose a, a solution. Some work better than others usually, but not all, all cases, and some require right away. Others don't. You just got to look at each, each one. Uh, of course, there are always community driver expectations issues. But for, for what maybe a little, little bump up there is for the unconventional, for the um, motorist who doesn't quite understand it, the safety usually is, is, is far outweighed by people by not having those extra conflict points. So, so, um, so it usually has a net safety benefit to the intersection. And I, and I think, by and large, the last sentence is, is, is that, particularly this, this, uh, this time, 
that uh, you know, look for cost-effective solutions. If we don't have the budget to do these, what can we do that's, you know, that doesn't hurt our capital program? Well, some of these sort of start to get that bill. So I've seen a lot of the, you know, visits and, and people positively responding to these kind of ideas because they, they recognize that that's what they can afford. So, anyways, that's all I have. Any questions? Please. Please. Um, uh, one of the things is that. Sorry, can, can you state your name and where you're working? Okay, you my, name, uh, my name is Elias Strotty, and I'm the okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh One of the things, uh, maybe with your experience, you may have seen that, that a lot of people who are trying to make the left turn, especially in the AMP, they're trying to go to a parallel freeway, you know, parallel to the arterial. But once they see that uh, the traffic for the through movement uh, is going better, Maybe they will continue on the arterial. So have you seen that uh, observation? I have, I have. In fact, I'll tell you, I, I sometimes make, I don't, I don't think it's a legal movement. You remember I talked about the bow tie where you go beyond, you do the round, well, maybe all of done this. If you, if you see a left turn so backed up, if you go a few hundred feet down the road, make a left turn into a gas station or something, turn around to the parking lot, come back down to your right. Am I the one that does that? Um, okay. Uh, so, but you can avoid a left-hand turn because you can see there's less congestion by, by doing something that would be a design. If you, so being, and, and the same thing too, the, the, like I'll use the beating u turn example, some people might not want to make that, that left hand turn, so they'll, they'll, they might use a whole other different road or a different collector road because they, don't, they, they want to appear at a place where they can better get out. So it does kind of rearrange traffic some, but for most people it's, it's, it's a big benefit to see that maybe you have to drive a little further, but once they get on that arterial, I can go and go straight and have fewer delays and go further better quality speed, so that's, that's the benefit of those. And the other one is that uh, you said that you're right that uh, the conflict points will decrease on that intersection, but still you're increasing the number of people going right in a lot of cases and then also making a U-turn, so you're increasing the conflict points. Yeah, 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 if you take, yes, right, at the main intersection, yes, you, you reduce, you go from 3rd to 12, but you're right, you introduce another set of conflict points over here, and, and those are usually like eight, eight, 8 or 12, but still the net total is different. And you're not, and, and, and congestion itself is, is, a, is a term too, because the more congestion you have, the more rear end, and so some other, uh, other types of accidents, uh, unintended consequences reduce as well. So yes, it's not quite one to one, but you do reduce, you at least move them somewhere else and have a different set of consequences. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask about air quality, so if, if there's any cities like, does it help improve air quality by like if you have a whole other like left turn lane that's going to be sitting up a lot of light or I don't, I don't know, are there air quality implications? Yeah, there are, and, and some people use it to, I, I'm not a air quality person, can't speak to all the particular matters, but, uh, but, but anytime you improve, anytime you improve congestion, you improve air quality pretty much. And, and in fact, if you get kind of vehicles moving, because again, some of these movements, even if you move a little further, you're at least moving, and so you're, you're, you're not sitting idle. And so that's what a lot of these, and, and you also have shorter cycle lengths, so instead of waiting at like for two minutes, with for one minute. So o overall, and again, I'd love to see some studies done uh, that, uh, that, that show the highlight that. Oh, in fact, you know what? I have to do it. One slide. It's hidden. And I think just a slide. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, this one. I hid this one. Um, this, was, this was a study done at one intersection in Greensboro, and they put in this, and it, they call it a quad roadway, then you meet it. <laughs> it's really more of a, a jump down, because it, it, it just, it's just a single ramp that takes you off this, this main roadway. So they eliminated left turns, just, just this one intersection. Um, and they did some more inside. So, so they, it was done 30 years ago, and someone did a study that about the delay that increased. They said, well, uh, traffic tripled, uh, congestion, left turns grew by 300%, but it still operates level surface C, and, and a quarter still isn't a bottleneck, so they, they, they relieve traffic. And then someone did this, you know, in 30 years, they said, well, based on these capacity estimates, they said, well, let's say 2.3 million hours of delay, uh, 180 tons of fuel, and 200 tons of particulate matter. Pretty big city. And then that's just, it's 30 years, that's just in the peak and peak alone. So yeah, you start to multiply that over, you know, days and months and years, there, there has to be some, some quantifiable benefits, even though I don't know if it's done studies, but they create great paper for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's something we are quantifying in our access management studies at least works. Okay. Yeah, uh, most of the Q lengths will also decrease. Uh, maybe in your simulation models when you ran the vision, you, you can see those. Oh, very much so, yeah. Because not, yeah, 
Not, not only was he in fact capacity, the cycle lengths are shorter. So there's even less time for you to build up the fuse already. So, yeah. Michael O'Reilly with City of Houston. Um, my question really is, uh, it seems like the performance measures to see the effectiveness of these things is, is really intersection related, mm -hmm. mostly. I know there is one NCHRP report that's looking at the uh, roundabout corridor. And what's the impact of roundabouts to put in a new corridor system? Yeah. Is there anything from these studies that has showed performance measures for a coordinated system? You know, like a, a long uh, travel time or things yeah. like that. You know, you're right. Let me give you an idea. Most you're right. Most studies are just focused on intersections. I know, I know Michigan has done some studies on, on a whole corridor, but again, they're more than maybe looking at delay experience on the corridor. I don't know if it gets into the, you know, the air quality or, or regional benefits, because sometimes you're going to be hard to compare apples to apples, you know, it's, it's sort of volume sets. And, and a lot of the before and after studies are you know, long periods between. But, but it, yeah, the models after this show with the definite travel time benefits, uh, you know, reduce congestion, reduce delay, and all those on corridor basis. And that's what I said. The more, the more you do these on corridor that basis, like in Michigan, they move, they move uh, uh, roadways that move uh, 130, 140,000 cars a day, which is a good freeway volume. They move those on, on that grade corridors. Um, so that's that's obviously a point to that to say. But, uh, um, but you know, the individual intersections, how much they improve the, the, the greater area, uh, you know, area. I don't know, um, but some. <laughs> Um, in terms of the media you term, um, if we do it um, on corridor base, uh, has any statistics showing the capacity improvement around the whole corridor compared to the conventional yeah. corridor? Yes, yes, that one, that one stuck in the study of death. Um, well, let's see, there's been a lot of stu studies on those. Uh, let's see. I have the slide. Sorry, my computer's bad. Click that pie again. I know, I know it's, on, it's on the CD too, this slide is. Oh, I don't have a slide for Well, it's on the CD. But yeah, there, there was a basic study done that says uh, if, if you're experiencing level service E, you would get a C, it's basically almost two letter grades, you would, you would in, in general, uh, that you would get a, a, by, by doing the same kind of system. Like you've got, you have a six lane uh, boulevard, you have a six lane medium turn, you can say about two letter grades on average, and it showed that. And the same thing they did accident surveys. Uh, they, would get, they get about 20% uh, improvement in accidents in most of these corridors. And if you want to throw a number out there, most of, most of these you know, initial design, and obviously a lot of factors going there, right? you're looking at about 20 to 40% capacity savings at an intersection. So that's, that's a lot. If you think about that, that's probably the equivalent of adding a lane. If you, the only way to get that much savings, I mean, ITS, we, we tell, say, if we get 10% improvement, that's great. But you never get 20, 30, 40% unless you add another lane. So, so again, going back here, if you can unlock an intersection, Maybe you don't have to unwind that corridor. So again, you're saving money by someone saying, well, I need a six-lane roadway. So no, you just need four lanes plus intersection improvements. And you can save yourself a lot of money by unlocking that, that, that really capacity to strengthen the whole corridor. Um, it seems like uh, those kind of in innovative um, design can greatly improve the capacity and operation. So um, has any thought been considered for like re changing the fashion, traditional functional classification? Um, because if uh, the level service can be upgraded, include like two grade, uh, it's pretty significant. Uh, yeah, you got uh, all kinds of paper ideas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 that is a point. Uh, yeah, and most of them are. They, they follow the same functional classifications on the streets. Uh, people call them, you know, in Michigan, you turn to the principal arterial system. But yeah, there's no special class for most of these. We'll have to submit all these to TRB. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Thank you all, all for coming. Thank you, Jonathan.